Is that good now? Okay. Thank you so much. The story I want to tell is based at the Department of Chemistry here at McGill. And we're really fortunate that one of Canada's uh, premier neurological institutes is on our campus, just a 10 minute walk up the hill at the MNI, Montreal Neurological Institute and Teaching Hospital. So this involves large collaborations from around the world I want to tell you about, but our main collaborator here is Professor Tim Kennedy, a neuroscientist, who's really accomplished an all around great guy because he was a McMaster student, of course. <laughs> His PhD with Eric Kandel at uh, Columbia, future Nobel Prize winner, and postdoc with Mark Tesla Levine at University of California, San Francisco. So this is a very large <laughs> project, and I have to give my acknowledgement slides now. Um, this has been really well funded by the Canadian government, and I'm kind of excited today because this is the first chance we have to talk about it. We had some IP protection, the papers didn't come out, they are now, so this is actually the first time I've been showing this work that we're able to do. And it's going to sound like a little bit of an ad for Canada because privately I've been talking to the funders um, who very generously gave $30 million for it, Healthy Brains for Healthy Lives, a collaboration between the Neurological Hospital and problems that they could identify that they could bring down campus that let chemists, physicists, and electrical engineers work on. And um, some of these Montreal Neurological Institute graduates from Hill got really good jobs in San Francisco at this startup company called Neuralink. Um, and this was founded by another Canadian, <laughs> Siobhan Zillis, um, who grew up in Toronto. She got a hockey scholarship to Yale University. And now she's helping run things with somebody else who you may or may not want to admit is Canadian <laughs> um, or brain machine interfaces. So I got to work as a consultant with Neuralink when I was on sabbatical with, again, it's a lot of acronyms, um, UCLA's California Nano Systems Institute. And now the current funding um, at York University um, received a similar grant on vision sciences, which is just over, but now the big money, and this is why I'm telling students this, <laughs> you're gonna be graduating and looking for jobs and postdocs, follow the money. York University just received $105 million for the next six years. They're gonna have trouble spending it. And they're gonna be looking for people that know how to work with materials. So it's a really large, um, group of people from around the world that are trying to work on one thing. And that's in general, to be able to manage the interface between biology, which is soft, wet, and squishy, and our technologies that work, which are generally not. Meaning that these are our traditional electrical engineering processes and um, materials way back from the 1950s, right? We prefer copper wire, we prefer free flowing electrons and circuits and hard materials. And that's often the often the difficulty. Um, so this gets into what sounds like science fiction. You know, this is how to engineer the, somebody bionic or a cyborg, right? Any cyborgs in the audience here today? I, excuse me, I just, uh, I was just in my office and I don't know if the audio, and the problem is resolved, but there's no audio. We started with so. an audio problem. Thanks for identifying that. I think we have it fixed, but somebody let us know if we still need another fix with this. Okay, sorry, thank you. So back to cyborgs. No cyborgs admitting themselves here. Sometimes you disguise yourself. You say that you're German or Lithuanian. Just to have it in the Depends how you define this, right? It's not so much science fiction. The interface of technology with biology is a lot more prevalent than you might think. For example, an overlap with science fact happens a lot. There's a lot of funding by the US military and militaries around the world. Service members return from deployment missing limbs. And this woman can think about lifting her left arm and the neural impulses make it all the way to a severed arm here. So it's possible then because of the right size and you can see them to be able to interface, decode those nerve endings and train the computer to be able to lift a bionic arm. So that's science present, science fact. And if you extend this to well, young students who are probably healthy enough, you don't have any of this artificial hardware in you, but maybe you've got a relative or somebody you know with an artificial hip joint or a stent made out of stainless steel to spring open clogged arteries. I don't suppose anybody knows what the last picture is here? Uh, that's okay, top student here. This is what we're gonna talk about today. This is interfacing with the brain. And if, if, if you drop down to lower tech stuff, you know, if you include 
contact lenses and dental work and sutures. You know, it's actually difficult for any of you sitting there not to have something artificial in your body that you're trying to mediate the interface with. So in that definition, aren't we all bionic? Aren't we all cyborgs? This is something that got me really excited, <laughs> the interface with the brain. We were just starting this collaboration at the Montreal Neurological Institute when we had a talk in 2015 by a group from Brown University. And it was wonderful timing. <laughs> they had their great discovery embargoed until the patents came out and um, science was just gonna release the paper. And it turned out that this talk was scheduled half a year before, but the paper got released that day. So John Donahue switched everything around and made Montreal his first announcement of when they were able to decode brain signals from this woman who's quadriplegic. So she can think about lifting her arm, but those signals aren't making it past the brainstem. So there's nothing physical to decode outside the brain. So instead, this device connected to her skull is trying to train a computer of 100 signals here that by practicing thinking about lifting her arm and taking a drink, machine learning is then able to decode this and run a robotic arm. This technology has been existing, but it's the decoding from the brain, which is really exciting. So the part of this is a very small set of pins that are in the motor cortex attached to this decoder. And this is what the computer is reading. Okay? It's called a Utah array. It was developed at the University of Utah. And it's either 10 or 11 or 12 pins by 12 pins. And well, you may think it looks like a cold, dark, dark, hard bed of nails, because essentially that's what that is. And the frustrating thing is they need to get this working, but where it fails is right at the interface. After just a few hours, this implant starts inducing astroglial scarring, right? The human body's got a really good ability to recognize what's not supposed to be in there and to set off rejection mechanisms, right? It tusses up, it wants to evict whatever's in there because your body isn't filled up with those bottom parts of the periodic table. It's not soft, wet, and squishy. It doesn't look like biology at all. So in fact, John Donahue admitted to us that they got this working with only about 15 pins out of 100 because the rest would just scar up. And a few days later, they'd have to implant again. Right? So how frustrating it is that you've got all this other technology working, but it's failing at the one nanometer interface between technology and biology. So even, you know, this was 12 years ago now, but seven years ago, but even current systems, if you um, can afford not to apply for the, uh, uh, to the government for a large amount of money, if you can take this out of your RBC client card, <laughs> You can work with smaller systems, which now fit more easily on the head, but it's the same basic idea. You've got a bundle of wires here. Now it's a heck of a lot more than a Utah array, and we're more flexible, right? It's a bundle of 32, and the initial systems had um, 48 of these bundles. Now they're up to 96. So it's a total of more than 3,000 electrodes, right? The smallest wires are just a couple of microns, and they're bundled together about the size of a human hair that can be implanted by a robot made out of a very hard tungsten ruthenium, right? Like a sewing machine. So you don't need a surgeon. That way it's really reproducible to be able to put this in, but essentially it's the same technology. You've got wires, which are me measuring an electric current. So, well, this is the quote from Neuralink. Their key challenge now is the biocompatibility. And they're throwing a lot of money at this too. The 150 million, that was just to get the thing off the ground. They're burning through 60, 70 million dollars a year. They've hired 220 people to be working on this. They got approval for human testing three years ago, but they delayed it three times. They just can't get the biocompatibility working with this. If you want to know more about Neuralink, they release, they release a video every four or six months, and it's really exciting to see where they are with this. But yeah, a lot of money and a lot of expertise is getting thrown at this problem. It's a difficult problem. The way I joke with my students is, well, we're still working with what the electrical engineers developed in the 1950s or way earlier, right? So I, I call it cutting edge in 99, but I'm not even meaning 1999. This is actually, if you go back to 224 years ago, um, this is Volta and Galvani, right? revealing the great discovery to the Royal Society in Europe. Anybody remember what's at the heart of 
what they're looking at here. What's what's the first bionic animal? Frog legs. Yep, right, Ignacio, frog legs. So they were able to induce a kicking of a clearly dead frog because it was more than decapitated, but it's the same materials. It's old style batteries with copper wires and zinc. So material wise, I venture that we haven't really improved much since then. And what we need are next generation materials. Okay, so I'll transition from science future and science fiction back into the present. But I did want to leave you with what the problem is and what I think the solution is for next generation materials. I know this is complicated and this is hard to read, but this is, each circle is a class of materials and they're grouped up together. The blue ones at the top are artificial hard materials from the bottom of the periodic table. And the green ones are from the animal kingdom, uh, which are softer. This is on the y-axis, the stiffness, the Young's modulus. And these are orders of magnitude, right? This is a logarithmic scale. So um, clearly the blue stuff is not just off in stiffness by a factor of two or five or 10, it can be too stiff by a factor of a million. And it's certainly too dry at the same time. Another similar problem, this is the bending rigidity and the moment of inertia. And our artificial stuff is clearly orders of magnitude off the natural stuff. Why would, why would inertia matter or rigidity? Well, you've got this thing clamped to the outside of your skull, right? And the electrodes are floating deep inside. And what's the water content of inside your skull? 92%, right? You're basically a bag of water with a soft piece of tofu floating around in there. So it's moving. And if you have a really hard, rigid material moving against your brain that's sloshing around, the doctors call this the um, fork in jello problem. It's slicing, right? And so this is another problem with, with, with all the scarring. You want to get the, the implant materials to behave mechanically the same way that your brain, your brain behaves to. And this is difficult with copper wires. So last slide about science fiction, but this is my hero. This is where I think we're going with the next generation. You students could be working on this in the decade. The best cyborg out there, another Canadian, Keanu Reeves, grew up in Winnipeg, I think, after being born in Lebanon. What's great about Keanu is that he is jacked into the matrix here with A, an optical cable, so there's no electrical signal, right? And B, even better for materials, this is a soft polymer optical fiber. Right? So the connection is with optics and not electronics, with photonics. And the connection is soft polymers, like what the human body is built on, and not hard electronics. Okay? So this is not science fiction on the left. This is optogenetics, which is, has been around for about 12 years now. Okay? Sniffy the rat has a soft polymer optical fiber and light is being used to interface with the brain and control behavior. Right? Optogenetics, opto with light. Unfortunately, the genetics part means that the mouse was genetically modified before this to be able to respond to light. So it's not as if the implant is interfacing and causing the behavior. The behavior is pre-programmed into the rat by genetic engineering. And this is done by splicing into the gene a light responsive part that can be based on some very simple organisms, um, light sensitive bacteria or simple opsins um, that turn on and turn off processes with the presence of photons or not. Okay? So this mouse has been genetically modified with a virus to respond to light so that when light is present, it opens or it closes channels. Uh, there's only a few groups in the world that can do this. It's a really big effort, Oxford, MIT, and Berkeley. And the Berkeley model, there are variations on this, is to use this elbow molecule, which responds to light and either closes or exposes an, a channel, membrane channel. And this elbow, his light response of, it's based on an azobenzene structure that has two forms, open and closed capped or uncapped, and it can respond to a single photon. Okay, so this is what's working with the mouse. And I would say that <laughs> back to biology, there's a very impressive interface here in this picture, but it's not the one you're looking at. It's not the artificial one. For inspiration and a guide to how we can couple photons with brain activity, we can just look at the eyes of this 
creature right, that have evolved over so long. At the heart of our vision is a self-assembled protein, rhodopsin, uh, which has seven cylinders nestled in our rods and our cones. And the center of this is a retinal molecule that, like an elbow, has two different forms. Okay? It's got a double bond with the absorption of a single photon that can go from a kinked to a straight conformation. What this does is it pushes just a couple of angstroms, but it, nest, it nudges on two of the cylinders, moves it just enough to kick out the tail at the bottom. This catalyzes, it exposes an acid base and catalyzes a reaction. And this action potential gets magnified and amplified about 5,000 times in energy. It's just spectacular how this works. And it leads to a vision event, right? So like a, a string of dominoes toppling down, one photon you can, you can see in a ah, purple, or however this is nestled in. So it, it demonstrates that one carefully designed photo switchable molecule is enough to trigger a large scale event and be able to mediate information between light and a brain. Unfortunately, you can't use retinol directly. It only works once. In the human body, you need an enzyme to come in and recant the molecule. So it's exceedingly complicated to mimic exactly. But that's what these azobenzines are. It's a mimic of retinol that is stable. You can go back and forth millions of times. A single photon is enough. And this shape change, if you engineer it into a larger molecule, is sufficient. Right? So that's what these azobenzines are. And you've actually seen them before because they're beautiful dyes in reds, orange, and, and yellows, depending on the substituents that you have. So they've been around for hundreds of years as colorants. As I look around and see, purple and pink and orange clothing, <laughs> you're probably wearing azobenzene dyes. Been around for a long time. You've also seen them in your chemistry lab in first year here at Mac, if not high school chemistry labs, because these beautiful colors are also sensitive to their local environment, right? As pH papers, here you've got a carboxylic acid that is coupled into this large pi delocalized system. So it is, um, yellow when the proton is off, actually. And when you lower the pH and put the proton on, it changes the pi structure enough that you get a really clear visual signal from this. Okay? So this demonstrates that these dyes can be sensitive to their local environment. And this is a really good test for um, third world water quality. Right? You take um, water from an unknown source that you're suspicious of, and put in a little bit of this azo dye or this pH paper, and if it turns red, it doesn't prove there's E. coli there, but it proves there's something in the water that's giving off acid. So, whoa, don't drink this, get it tested. But, you know, it's really hard to beat as a diagnostic, right? You don't need electricity. You don't need any education to run this. It's one cent per test. You know, it's just the dream second and third world war, uh, third world, um, third world diagnostic. What's clever about the azobenzenes is that they also perform a little trick, just like the retinol, right? They change from a trans to a cis geometry. And like retinol, they can be cleverly enough engineered into a system to amplify that shape change. Then you can lead to sensing and signaling, both in, 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 in contact with biology, right? The sensing with a color change, the signaling with a push and a cascade of a reaction. Um, this has been around for a long time, actually. I first encountered this as a graduate student a million years ago. Um, students in the audience, these are called compact disks. <laughs> and at one point, they were the mechanism of storage. But the very first rewritable ones involved these azobenzenes that could be pointed in different directions really quickly and rewritten and erased on a few nanoseconds. Right? So it's a good technological base with these things. And now we're trying to apply them to um, biocompatible systems. So the azo is there, it's on a polymer backbone, so we know where it is and it doesn't bleed away. And the polymer backbone is based on weak acids and weak bases that are water soluble, better toxicity, and we can work with them in a biological environment, right? We don't need organic solvents for this. So the way we work with them is when we have a surface that's really clean, um, most metals, almost all metals, if you clean them really well, you get a negative charge. And so this positive 
sorry, this negative molecule sticks on whatever is a positive charge. So you can layer them on a surface, depending on the charge, positive, negative, positive, negative, starting with the opposite charge on a surface. Okay? And this is for biocompatibility, what we started with. We just took implants and dipped them back and forth in oppositely charged polymers to be able to put thin gel biolayers on the surface. And what's really great is they're stuck only with electrostatic forces, right? It's just positives and negatives, but they're really sticky. So you can put them in boiling water for a week and they don't come off, right? They're really well adhered. And you don't have to stop at two layers. You can actually keep going up to 10, 20, 30, 100 layers. And each layer that goes down fills with more water gets softer and it starts to resemble biological tissue. So you have a little robot that just dips whatever implant you have, and this is what Neuralink is doing, compact lens manufacturers, Bausch and Lomb are doing, and other implants is dipping back and forth between positive and negative polymers, assessing the reduction in stiffness, the increase in water content, and you stop when you've matched the tissue that you wish to be biocompatible. So it's really not rocket science, is it? But it, it works really, really well. These multi-layers of polyelectron. So, so to combine these for the brain-machine interfaces, you can see we have azobenzenes here, and we have a lab full of positively charged polymers and a lab full of negatively charged polymers. So we just put these together in all kinds of combinations to see which had the best biocompatibility. Okay? Instead of coding implants, once and waiting to see what happened to the patient or the animal. Um, it's by far more effective to do this outside the body. What you do is you prepare surfaces. Let's say you've got eight <laughs> positives and eight negatives. You can set these up in a 64 well plate, right? So each well plate is a different combination. Then you just smear in the neural cells, right? So you've got 10,000 cells in each plate. You can do the experiment once. You put the cells down, you wait a few days, and you let the cells tell you what's most biocompatible. If the cells, what you measure is just how big the cells are. You know, you set up your, your camera on your phone and a simple piece of software to analyze the picture. And if it's a really poor surface, like bare metal, after even a few hours, the neural cells are beating up and they're dying, and your camera tells you that. But if it's a good surface, even after a few days, neural cells are getting comfy and happy. Oh, this is a nice mattress. You know, I feel like home. They're sending out their processes and they're thriving. So they're getting bigger. And these are all the code names for all the different positive and negative combinations. And it's all being compared in red here to polydelysine, which is the standard for neural cell culture. This is what Petri dishes are coded with to be able to grow neural cells really well in the lab. So many of our systems did not work as well, but we have a few combinations that worked just as well as, as polydelysine. But then they're active for neural communication at the same time. So this was a long project I like to emphasize to the students that, well, we started this in 2013 and we just got the first positive results after lots of screening. Because there's lots of other variables too. Um, the pH that you put these things down, the salt concentration, um, working in a biological environment, not just in pure water. And I'll be able to show you the rest of this diagram today, but for a couple of years, this was cut off because we found a couple of combinations that were actually way better than polyelicin, but I can show them to you in a few slides now. Okay, we have to be able to assess what we've done to get a feedback mechanism. So I know you've got great instrumentation here at McMaster too, including an ellipsometer, which bounces a laser beam off a surface and can tell because it's atomically flat within a few nanometers what the thickness and what the density is. And if you work in a liquid cell, we can look at our multi layers and the density shows us the water content. It's easy to measure something dry and cold, but we want to take this up to body temperature and put it inside a biological environment to see, like little sponges, you know, how these layers absorb up and what the neural cells see. So we can do that by ellipsometries. We add water and we watch the thickness increase and the refractive in increase, refractive index decrease. And for surface energy, a really simple experiment is just to place a drop of water on the surface. And this is reflected off a highly reflective surface, so it looks, looks doubled. But the angle that, of contact that drop makes is proportional. The, 
the square of that angle is proportional to the surface energy. So even just looking at a drop of water and taking a picture with your camera, you can actually back out a crude measurement of the hydrophilicity, hydrophobicity, which is really important actually to cells. Another measurement we can take of the stiffness is actually taking AFM tip and pushing into the material as a spring, right? And the force distance curve. And we can measure adhesion by actually pushing, by coating the AFM tip at the same time, pushing in and then measuring the force that it takes to pull off. By electron microscopy, it also shows you visually what these layers look like. So this, this is the biocamouflage, um, 30 layers that are really thin because they were put down at a pH where the um, charges were, were fully expressed. And the same 30 layers expressed in really loopy systems. So the pH and the salt of the absorption bath make a difference too. But this way we could find the conditions that were best for neural felicity and for biocompatibility. Okay, so here's the, now we've got a way to biocompatibilize implants. Now we wanna make them active to be able to sense and to signal back from neurons. So this is, I'm gonna talk about the work of two PhD students. <laughs> Students in the audience, what could be worse than taking your entire PhD and summarizing it on one slide right after all your blood, sweat, and tears? So this is worse, actually, because I'm taking two PhD students and I'm summarizing both their work on one slide. But these really talented students, Alex Goulet Hansons, was tasked with trying to signal to a neural cell, right? trying to use the azobenzene photoswitches to be able to um, have the cells take notice and set off any sort of physiological response. Uh, another wonderful student, Tom Singleton, who's now re-employed back at the Montreal Neurological Institute, was tasked with trying to listen to the cells. If you have a synapse releasing, instead of recording electrical signal with a wire, what more gentle way using photons and soft materials can you get the same information if a synapse is firing? If there's um, a neural pathway that's active. And so he developed fibers that were a similar size to a synapse. And like pH paper, he tried to develop a dye that was sensitive to dopamine. So we would change color if there was a little burst. And in a way, on the right is listening to a neuron, and on the left is a way of talking back to a neuron. Okay, so Tom's stuff first. The way he did this was some basic chemistry of um, boronic acid. Right? What these neurotransmitters have in common here, this is dopamine, uh, norepinephrine, which is noradrenaline, and epinephrine, is subtle variations of a catechol structure, right? So you've got these two OH groups. So this sensing is not specific to dopamine, but it's specific to that class of neurotransmitters that get released during a synapse event. And the idea with the um, boronic acid is this catechol binds reversibly on, off, on, off. And when it does, just like the acid from uh, pH paper, it locks into the pi delocalized structure and it, it can change its color. So we're trying to use a, a color change to sense a small amount of dopamine just from a nanometer, nanolayer on a surface. So like pH paper, if there's dopamine or not dopamine, can we use a color change of a, of a carefully designed azobenzene that interacts with dopamine and not with acids or bases? The first experiment to start is the really crude one where you take a cuvette filled with your boronic acid, which happens to be orange here, and you dump in loads of dopamine, way more than would get released in a synapse and let it go for a really long time, at too many molar equivalents. But we want to, Get the system working where it's easy, where you've got a lot of stuff and you've got a lot of time and you've got a lot of excess. Then slowly back it down into the conditions where it's on the end of a fiber and you're detecting not much stuff really quickly um, at not much excess. And then, well, that's why engineers are paid so much money. <laughs> we try to develop a lab scale that hopefully somebody else can figure out how to optimize into a real solid state system. But you do get a really good color change. Even your human eye can see it goes from orange to pink, and your spectrometer and a little bit of machine learning can certainly tell when dopamine is there and when dopamine is not. So the second step, moving from a, a cuvette inside your UV visible spectrophotometer 
we have the surface of um, a very thin film here, just a few nanometers. And by exposing this into dopamine, we can still see the orange to pink transition. And then the last one was tiny drops approximating the end of a fiber. And we could see this as well. The idea is you bounce the light down the fiber and it comes back. And this is how you see it. Okay, how am I doing for time? I got about 10 more minutes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. So that is talking. So that's listening to a neuron. And what I'm going to finish up with is how do you talk back? So Alex Willey Hansen's, he is trying to use the mechanism of shape change of these light responsive azobenzenes with a great big head group that the neurons care about, that cells use to trigger a neurological response. To start with this, before something really big, you can look at the changes just in the contact angle, the wettability of a surface. When you've got a series of head groups on the azobenzene, which are hydrophilic or neutral or strongly hydrophobic, something like Teflon. So each of these has a different contact angle. But what you're really interested in is how much that changes when you shine light on the system. Okay? Can you make a water droplet bounce back and forth to use that to signal to the neuron that it's either uncomfortable and get comfortable or comfortable and get uncomfortable? So we got this working with bouncing water droplets with non-biological head groups. And with a great synthetic effort, our neurobiologist told us that this RGB cyclic peptide is a common marker for signaling in biological pathways. I'm not a biologist. I can't really appreciate this. But apparently, if this RGB is there, it triggers biological response. I just... I. Would always forget the structure, so I call it the donut. It's like showing a donut. Ooh, that's delicious, you know. So this is the biological donut for neurons, and we got that working too. So we can have a surface where the neurons were barely happy; they could sit there for a day, but then when we shine light to expose the head group, then they would start growing out their processes. So we had a system where a burst of light again with a soft, wet system could be able to induce the change. We could make cells grow. But what's really difficult, and you'd appreciate this in the Brockhaus Institute, is making a measurement and knowing what you've done. With a lot of this bioengineering, you can get it working, but sometimes you have no idea why. So where we got backed up was trying to measure things underwater. And that's the subject of another talk or, or a paper if anybody wants to chat about that. Okay, so um, students, there are a couple of review articles that I'll gladly share. One on using light to exert control over biological systems, including neurons, and another one on the codings that I'll share too. But I want to go back to our recent discovery, I haven't been able to share yet, of which combinations of the material work best. And I'll finish up with showing you the state of the art of what we've got. Okay. So these are measurements that surprised us. We coded surfaces with some polymers in our lab. And they were upwards of twice as good as commercial poly D lysine. Right? The cells just love this stuff. And our super secret, secret code that you could probably decode here has an SF in them. And that stands for silk fibronin. Okay, so we've moved away from artificial polymers and we just scrounged around the lab. We found some cellulose, we found some seaweed, we found some chitin, chitosan from shrimp shells and lobster shells, right? Very Canadian. And turns out that the silk that we got from silkworms, the neurons just love that stuff. And so students, here is a second review article if you're interested on um, how to interface materials with a neuron, what they like. And it was a review over a hundred years of the state of the art of optogenetics backing up to <laughs> azobenzene multilayers being able to measure self-assembled systems in monolayers. But what I thought was fun was a paper from way back in 1914 showed that spider webs were actually really good neural support mechanisms. In the early days, people had microscopes and they wanted to see a synapse. They wanted to see the neural focus. Um, but the cells were dying. They don't like glass. They don't like anything else they had in the lab at the time. So they couldn't see them. But this researcher, Harris, in 1914, pulled out some old petri dishes in the back. They were covered with spider webs. The neural cells love them, right? These circles are the neural cells. 
these are his figures from his paper in 1914, and especially the intersects of um, filaments of silk thread. The neural cells were happy and they grew. So we didn't discover this. It's been long known that silk works really well. We just didn't know why. So this led to another collaboration with the Tokyo Institute of Technology. And we started looking at commercial silks. These are not spider silks, but very similar, similar, similar chemically are silk cocoons about the size of your thumb. And the world silk industry is built from this, right? A billion of these get produced in Southeast Asia every year. And this is the heart of the textile industry of silk. They cost just a few cents each. And it's actually a beautiful material. The worm spins these out of their mouth as they wrap around as part of their 42 day cycle to turn into a moth, right? So it's a single filament. It's about a kilometer long. So even just the mechanics of this are, are awesome. The worms are really cute. They only eat mulberry leaves. Here, this is me in, in Cambodia looking at one of the farms. That's why they're grown in Southeast Asia because that's where their only food lives, natural forests of mulberry. Okay? It's more difficult to try to reproduce them here. Um, but you can see in a basket here that's mimicking the underside of the leaves, the various stages of their development where you have worms that haven't started yet, worms that have just started to spin, and worms that are almost finished. These ones are yellow. Some of the specialty silks have a natural color. It's unfortunate that the world's textile industry is dominated by one silk that doesn't have a color. So you can dye it anything you want. But actually, some of the most beautiful ones are these yellows, which have sort of been bred out of existence. It's been said. But I collected a number of different silks from around Southeast Asia, and we tried those in the lab. It turned out the Cambodian silk, this yellow one, is by far the best. Um, Naturally, what they do is they boil the cocoons in water with a base, right? It's all non-toxic, aqueous base. But these silk farms often don't even need electricity. It's just amazing how sustainable they are. Um, she's got a pedal here with bicycle parts, and she it, it teases apart the glue, the saracen that holds the fibers together, and she's weaving this into a thread directly. The industry is just amazing in its simplicity. So we tried growing these in Montreal. We had a student, we found some mulberry trees that were growing at the um, Arboretum on McGill campus. And we got permission to harvest some of the leaves. We were growing silkworms in the lab from these um, eggs from the Cambodian silk. And I thought this was great for sustainability. We're hard, they're eating leaves on campus. We're growing the silkworms in our lab, spinning them into biocompatible materials, walking them across campus to do the neurological um, silk work. So we adopt the same process. You just boil them, you cut them apart with scissors, you boil them gently in water soluble, all the waste can go down the drain. It gently removes the gluey saracen that holds them apart, and then you get these, these fibers showing up. We can functionalize them with azobenzene to make the biocompatible silk then active both for sensing and for signaling back to neurons. So hence the reds, orange, and yellow colors of this thing. So this is azosilk, dyed and neurocompatible. And the last couple of slides I'll show you before questions are all the different head groups that we had to try to see which ones were best for them. Parts of the human body are very narrow in their requirements for what's comfortable, right? You don't, you want to be soft, but not too soft, firm, but not too firm. Wetting but not too wet, dry but not too wet. There's only about a 20% window that the cells know that they're home. Right? So you have to prepare a heck of a lot of these, 16 or even 20, to be able to get the ones that are most biocompatible. Yeah, we got up to 28 different variations of the azo cell. And we would put water droplets on from everything from really hydrophilic to super hydrophobic. Plate the cells and let the, let the cells choose A, what's most comfortable, but B, actually. We wanted them at the edge of their comfort level. Because if they're really, really comfortable and we shine light, who cares? They're already comfortable, right? If they're really, really uncomfortable and we shine light, that's not going to change their mind. We want to get them when they're just barely happy so that the light either makes them barely unhappy or if they're barely unhappy, we want to get them barely happy. Right? We want to get the regime, the Goldilocks zone, where the light will have the greatest influence. So we did a lot more cell plating and we can plot things like the contact angle versus cell survival, 
We can also do the modulus of the materials. And we find that the cells are happy is not at one extreme or the other, but again in the middle somewhere. Should we tune in with whatever head group made the cells barely happy in this way we can switch back and forth? I'll finish up with two more slides to be able to show you where we are with the state of the art. We've been able to make these materials not just on surface, but woven into mats by um, electrospinning. And this way, we get these beautiful fibers. So we can work with the material um, in a form that's more usual for biomedical engineering, right? They're gauzes, they're weaves, they're strong, and it's not just coating the surface. So with that, I think I'll just show the final result where what we can do, back up a slide. I want to show the structure of the Saracen again. Yeah. <laughs> this, these um, silk regions are crystallizing into beta sheets. This is what's holding it together and keeping it from being water soluble. What we're trying to do with the azo is disrupt these beta sheets. So it removes them. It, it, it breaks up the crystallites, and then the whole thing becomes much, much more soft by an order of magnitude. And then the cells respond to that. Okay. So if, if you take the azo silk, if you take the weave and you shine light on it, it breaks apart all of the crystallites and the whole material dissolves. That doesn't do you any good. What we do with convocal microscopy is we irradiate just below the surface. You can see it in the cross section on the right here that these squares, at 25 micron square, are being written not at the surface because that would dissolve it, but below the surface, either near the surface or very deep, and we get bubbles that are formed. So water rushes in and the surface becomes really, really soft, changes by up, upwards of an order of magnitude. So you can use this to write patterns. We have a visiting professor from Tufts University who helped us a lot with the silk and the bioengineering. And this way we could irradiate with our confocal microscope different patterns and have that morphology on the surface respond really well to neurons. Basically what we're doing, this is an atomic force microscope to show irradiated versus unirradiated. We start with a material that's stiff, too stiff for a brain, we zap it and it becomes just as soft as a brain, right? By an order of magnitude. So this is our state of the art now where it's helping the system. And where we left off just before COVID was being able to write strips here and have cells move up and down to be able to guide neural cells on a surface too. So I know I've just hit you with a lot of information. Uh, that's a good place to start. I'm gonna skip right to the end to be able to thank not that I thought I was going to get through these slides here. <laughs> okay. Um, last comment. The stuff is toxic. You can't put this in the body with these fake azobenzene. Okay. Here's our last idea to be able to use photo switches at lowest toxicity. These are the structures we're working with now that have evocative names like sunset yellow and a lunar red. And the reason they're named like this is they are non toxic. They're low enough toxicity that you're allowed to eat <laughs> unlimited amounts of it, right? These are the official food colorings of your red, orange, and yellow junk food. And the FDA has no restriction on the amount of craft dinner students can eat, right? So we're working with silk, which is already biocompatible, and we're working with um, food dyes, which don't have a limit on their intake. And I think this is where we can go from here. So I know I gave you a lot of stuff in my time, but thank you so much for your attention. And I'd really be glad to stay with students after answering questions in chat. Okay, we do have time for questions, so. Thank you for the lovely talk. Um, I actually want to come back. You did an experiment with, uh, I believe there's dopamine and the boronic acid. At some point, you mentioned a fiber there. I just wanted to come back to that and just ask, like, what really was that fiber and why did you insert a fiber in there? Yeah, great question about the dopamine sensing and what's a fiber got to do with it. We got it working for a flat surface, but what our dream is to be able to get into a brain and use a fiber the same size as a neurite with a synapse. So it's an artificial neurite to be able to come in, nestle up closely, and with 
a release of neurotransmitters to be able to sense that at the end of a fiber. So it just a one to two micron fiber, which is about the limit of smallness that you can do, is the same size as a neuron. So we want to be able to detect single neural events. And we haven't got it working with the fibers yet, but we got it working with the smallest drops that we could. But our dream is the end of a fiber. So that's what the fibers have to do with it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris, for a great talk. Um, I wanted to ask you about the neural cells and why they prefer silk fibrin versus other other surfaces. I mean, silk fibrin doesn't have RGD sequences, so it's not sort of that kind of adhesion. Uh, it's not mediated through RGD sequences. Do you have any idea or any comments? Yeah, a great that? question. Why silk? Um, not only do I not have any idea, but I don't think anybody's got a great idea. That's why we screen so much. We're kind of in the dark ages of approach to this. I don't know what it is about silk that was twice as good as anything else. Um, maybe I'm not surprised that a natural material is better than an artificial material, but we don't have a measurement. We can't trace it back to the chemistry. I'm sure there are exceedingly complicated mechanisms that permit a cell to recognize what's supposed to be home. And whatever it is, we triggered enough of them. But I mean, that's a great question from a scientist is why? And the answer is we don't know. But, Students take on this question because <laughs> there could be something way better. There probably is something way better. We just got lucky with the silk. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Really interesting work. I'm just curious, how do you go about coding your AFM zips and how do you measure the thickness of the coding on them? Yeah, um, great question. The coding is so simple. You take a glass of your positive polymer in water, glass of your negative, and you just dip the stuff back and forth. You're in between. But you know, a minute is enough, so you can set a robot doing. So you can dip anything, right? You can dip the insides of nanotubes. You could dip. So yes, yeah, so we took the AFM tip on a pair of tweezers. We just dipped it back and forth. The way we know the thickness is by making an analogous dip on a flat surface. So we bounce a laser beam, or we did a lot of neutron reflectivity actually, um, and then we just guessed that the um, AFM tip had the same thickness. The thickness actually doesn't matter. We know we put 30 layers, um, but we're guessing at the thickness. But you can dip anything. That's what's great. The first student to graduate with this um, went off and worked for a contact lens manufacturer. And they've got these trays that they dip in the size of swimming pools back and forth. And it makes Bausch and Lomb's uh, secret recipe contact lenses. It's not rocket science. It's just really simple. You can dip anything. That's what's great. Water only. Flush it down the drain. Um, when you were creating your two uh, switches that you were doing for both uh, sensing the neurons as well as like talking to them, would you be able to uh, create the uh, system using both of those, both read and talk to it? If so, would those switches be able to each other? Yeah, great question. That's our dreams. We've got one fiber that nestles in nice and soft to you know, a bundle of thousands of these fibers. And we have two different azos on the surface. One functions like a pH paper for dopamine and ideally does not interfere with the other azo that photo switches, right? So we could separate the wavelength of those. For example, you come in with laser light and we could address the azo that needs to talk to be able to isomerize, but not address the azo that needs to listen. And if the azo needs, if the azo that's listening isomerizes, maybe that's okay too. But yeah, we haven't put them together yet, but our dream is a coding at the end of the fiber that can both talk and listen and be accepted as a neuron. And in maybe just 15 or 18 years, we might be. <laughs> uh, basic thought. So for the still incorporation into the gel, is that easy process to have been used by how that comes out? Um, silk incorporation of the gel, you mean making the silk photoresponsive or just making the electrospun silk? One of the slides where it shows the hyperdiversity yeah, that was put on. Okay, so it's a one step reaction. There's a tyrosine uh, group that hangs off the silk and it's got an, a ring and an OH, and it's one step reaction away from putting all those different head groups on. So it's it's pretty accessible chemistry to many of you in this room. It's, it's, it's not that difficult. It's a single step reaction, and we got high yield. You know, we could make 30 of these pretty readily. So um, I'm actually really happy to say that putting everything together might be difficult, but each step that I showed you today, you can do this at home. It's kitchen chemistry, right? 
bring it into McMaster for the expense of characterization, but it's all water-based and it doesn't, you know, we want something that can be used around the world. We want something that could be implemented in anybody's lab and not create organic waste. Let me be I just had a good question regarding you guys are using is this something that you're hopeful that it's going to be applied to other neurotransmitters? And then is that like the final part? So it's like multiple of these just be part of the environment? Yeah. Great question. Why dopamine first? Because it was the easiest and it's what interacts with, we didn't try anything else. We just got really lucky that our first design was boronic acid. But in principle, like all the pH indicators, um, if you on the back of a cocktail napkin in the Phoenix can come up with uh, a dye that binds selectively with your neurotransmitter of choice and changes the color, you're off to the races. So in principle, I think you could, but it would require a separate design. We just worked with the dopamine because it was simple, easy first, and we got lucky. Chris, with your multi-layers, the, the polyelectrolyte multi-layers, how many layers do you need to make a, an implant more compatible with uh, biological tissue? Yeah, great question. How many layers? Well, each layer that goes down gets softer and wetter. So you kind of stop whenever you've matched up into the body. So if, if you want to match up with muscle, 10 layers is fine, or 20. You can do that by hand, a few minutes each and, and rinse it. But other parts of your body, um, this is why implant testing for muscle, it's, it's called the pork chop test. If you want to see if your implant will not buckle and your coating stays on, around the world you go by a center loin pork chop because it's really reliable and reproducible around the world. You poke that in. So that's a good thing. But for a brain, you need soft tofu, right? So brains, you need hundreds of layers. And this is when I had to buy my students a robot. Um, Ozzy Merman set the record, 1,400 layers by hand over a long weekend. Um, now we have robots that the dip back and forth. There was a brief student mutiny that we did. <laughs> Good thing this isn't recorded. <laughs> okay, I think with that, let's uh, please join me in thanking Chris for the topic.